and welcome to our coverage of Gamma Expo 2020. I am joined by a very special guest. This is Steve Horvath. Steve, how are you doing? Good. How are you, Zach? Uh, I'm great. So I, I noticed we've this is our eighth time to sit down with you officially on camera and chat. Uh, wow. We've obviously had a lot of conversations, but eight, it was actually, you may be one of our most interviewed personalities on <laughs> okay. the channel that's not right. actually a part of Covenant. So uh, tell me a little bit of people that may, maybe aren't familiar with you, um, what your role is at Asmo Day and kind of how you got here. Well, I'm kind of interested in what my role is in Covenant then at eight times. Does that mean like I've basically honorary, salary, yeah. honorary <laughs> something? Uh, so um, with Asthma Day, my day job, I guess. Um, when, you're I, not, when you're not creating content. When I'm Covenant, not creating yeah. content with you guys, <laughs> um, I'm president and head of publishing for Asthma Day North America. Okay. So what does that mean? It's a big fancy title. What, say, good question. What that really means is uh, the U.S. studios all report to me. So I'm and responsible. Studios being the entities actually designing and making the games. Yes, yes. So that would be Catan, Fantasy Flight Games, uh, which we have a lot to talk about them today, I sure. think. Um, we have Unexpected Games, which is Corey Konitska's brand new studio. Nice. That we'll be hearing about his first cool game. It's going to be announced in the next couple months. All right. Right? Um, and then we also have... Atomic Mass out on the West Coast. Okay, and they're yeah. doing the Crisis Protocol. Doing game. the Crisis Protocol game, yeah. So the last time we actually officially talked, I, I do think we're overdue. It was back in 2016, Whew. which seems like, that just seems crazy. It's uh, a long time ago or yesterday, depending on how you look yeah, at it. It was right? fast and slow all yeah. at the same time. Yeah. Uh, but at the time, you got Fantasy Flight games, and it, I believe at the time you were actually working for Fantasy Flight, um, or maybe it was uh, close. By 16, I was transferred to Asthma Day. Asthma Day. Yeah. Um, so at the time, you'd... Fantasy Flight had just announced Star Wars Destiny. Uh, yep. We're both big Star Wars fans. Mm -hmm. We're both card game fans. Yep. So we, we had a lot to talk about there. A lot of excitement. There was a lot of buzz going on around about the game. Obviously, recently, Fantasy we Flight... We played a big match at Star Wars Celebration one year, too. Yes, we did. Yes. Uh, I remember that distinctly. I won't yep. say who won. Uh, oh, but, you did. <laughs> I wasn't going to say it's it. It's true. Spoiler. You did, though. Um, but the... Obviously, the announcement recently of Set 9 being the last yep. official set mm -hmm. in booster boxes and whatnot. So... Uh, a lot has happened both at Fantasy Flight, but I think even beyond that, uh, I could talk about Destiny for days, as I do on the podcast yes. often, but uh, is a lot has also happened at Asmo Day. Mm -hmm. um, and even recently, there's a lot of news coming off of mass layoffs. We have uh, people that we're aware of and the, mm -hmm. I think the public aware of. Head of studio, Andrew Navarro, uh, left yep. the company not that long ago. I saw a couple days ago a, a designer that's somewhat mm -hmm. known as Brad, who Brad, yep. the, on Keyforge has also gone. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of speculation Yes. And a lot of stuff going mm -hmm. on, uh, and I feel like I'm very excited because you're here willing to be on camera to tell us what's actually going on. So yeah. uh, whatever makes sense from the past three or four years that's been happening that, to, to explain what's been happening in the past month, I think, would be really helpful. Okay, uh, where do you want cool me to start? I don't know. Where, where do you want to start, right? I mean, uh, a lot of stuff's happening. So what's yeah. happening and, and maybe what preceded it? Okay, so uh, we're calling this incarnation of Asthma Day, Asthma Day 3.0. Okay. As we've gone, there were some big shifts in 2018. Um, All right, so like a year and a half, two years yes. ago. Yes, yeah, right. And you know, uh, some of the original founders left the business at the end of 18, yep. right? Um, and we changed, uh, it's public knowledge that our major investor changed hands to a new investor. The group kind of got reformed. Um, and kind of now what we're doing is rebuilding and redefining who we are and how we go to be successful in a marketplace that's changed so dramatically over the past five years. Sure. You know, I've been doing this now for 30 years because I'm old. That's crazy. Um, I'd like to say I started when I was eight, but that's not true. I'm, <laughs> I'm just older now. Um, and there's been more changes the last five years in our industry than I would say the 25 before that. And so we've taken a hard look at the business and we've made some pretty dramatic changes that we feel is going to be the best going forward. And some people have decided that it was time for them to move on and do different things. Um, I'm not going to speak for Andrew. He's more than capable of speaking for himself. He's going off on a new adventure. We wish him absolutely the best of luck in everything that he does. And uh, Brad wants to try some new things too. We get that. As much as you know, we call it our work family because we spend more time at work than we do anything else, right? And so you really get to become close with the people that you work with, and it is becomes like a work family. Sometimes, just like your regular family, they go and take a job in another city and move away or do something like that. So they're still part of our extended family, but they're going to go do something different now. Sure. I, I understand that. 
Just because I'm decided to stick it out for the long run doesn't mean everybody's going to. I totally understand um, that, yeah. And we still have plenty of, you know, 10, 12, 15 year veterans there that probably will outlast me. So, so there's that. You never know. You're, you're pretty, uh, pretty stalwart, I think. Uh, yeah, yeah, <laughs> usually. Well, uh, anyways, so on that note, right, yeah. uh, people may not be completely familiar with, uh, at some point back in 2014, 2015, Asmodee and Fantasy Flight became one entity. Mm -hmm. um, and it sounds like what you're saying is there were market level changes uh, that required Asmodee to react or to, to respond and change and grow. Well, and, and we're trying to be proactive about that, too. Right, and so with uh, FFG, we should might, might as well just go ahead and dive into that. Yeah, right? I mean, like we looked at that. FFG has been a market leader since I joined the business in two thousand eight, right? But as I said, market conditions changed a lot, and we felt like we had to change with that. So this isn't something I did in a vacuum. It wasn't something mandated from on high. It's something I worked with the senior leadership team at FFG with over a period of several months and um, came to the conclusion that we need to make some big changes. So one of those changes, and I know one question you probably have, and I'll just jump in and answer it before you ask, is like, what's happening with RPGs? Are RPGs going away? Yeah, because one of the speculative points was that RPGs were just being cut entirely. That is not true. Um, it is true that the RPG team at Fantasy Flight closed. Uh, that was very unfortunate. There's some great people there. They're going to be doing an incredible amount of freelance work going forward on the RPGs. Nice. But Asmodee is opening up an RPG studio in Europe that's okay. going to be dedicated to just making RPGs every day, all day, to be the best possible RPG business there is. And is that a new entity? or is it's, that a a new, a it's a new entity forming based off of some industry veterans that have been uh, working on RPGs for 15 to 20 years. Uh, many of them have been with Asmodee for a very, very long time as well. They've done a lot of work with us on the RPGs that we've done, especially on the localization front and some of the, some of the graphics as well with some of them. Uh, they're the guys behind um, the End of the World series of RPGs okay. they'll be con that, that we published in, in the U.S. Uh, and they'll be continuing that line, and they'll be continuing all of the FFG RPGs. So Star Wars... Legend of the Five Rings, Genesis will all continue to go on. Very cool. We're finishing releasing the last few books that we had in the pipeline that were nearly done on all of those lines as it's being transferred over to them. But by the end of the year, they'll be up and running fully on that. Nice. So you mentioned uh, briefly and you know, going to whichever of these that is worth uh, chatting about, but the changes in the market, mm -hmm. uh, particularly since even like 2008, you said when you joined Fantasy yep. Flight Games. Uh, so, in your view, like, what about the market changed in that 12-year period? I mean, we were here, too. That, that's yeah. actually, so we started, Covenant started in 2007. So that's, mm -hmm. that's literally when we also kind of entered, yeah. entered stage left. Uh -huh. um, so what changed in that time, in, in your view? Barrier to entry dropped dramatically. Okay. Some of that's from Kickstarter. Some of that's just from other advances in technologies and, and people deciding they wanted to be part of this crazy business. Right? But uh, for instance, last year, over 3,500 brand new games were released into the market. It's quite a few. How many did you carry? Well, we're, we're a unique bird, I think. Uh, uh, sure. But, uh, How many do you think the average or even the best retailer in the, in the country carried? I would guess that, uh, you know, we're, we're very focused. So yep. we, we are at like 10 or 15 max. Sure. Um, but I think that probably most, most retailers were 30 to 50. Maybe a hundred if they're okay. like pretty aggressive. Like a okay. hundred games seems like a lot. That's that's so, like two a week. There's weeks that a hundred games come out now. Yes, that's an issue. Okay, for on so, a lot of levels. Yeah. And I'll say there's probably some stores. Let's say they're carrying five hundred or eight hundred games in their store. Yeah, you're still barely three thousand five hundred, and they're carrying maybe eight hundred, maybe, and that's a handful. What's the majority of them carrying? So that means most of those games aren't finding a home or they're finding a very, very small niche. Or they're finding a home on like distribution shelves. Uh, yes, <laughs> which, isn't, which isn't good either. Yeah, right? that's a problem. Like that's, not, that's, that's bad for the overall business, right? Yeah. It's not sustainable. So one of the things that I've been looking at and working with the, the heads of studio that I work with is we're releasing less games, but we're going to make a bigger effort to push through the noise of the industry and really make them impactful. 
and really make them something that that fans can count on, that retailers can count on, that distribution can count on. So is that connected, I assume, in some way? Because And I don't know how deep it, it went, but there was obviously news coming out of layoffs and downsizing yeah. and whatnot. There was, there was some layoffs. There was some downsizing. It was really hard. Like I said, it's, it's yeah. a work family. Uh, it was undoubtedly the hardest thing I've ever had to do professionally. It's not fun. Uh, no, it wasn't fun at all for anybody, anybody involved. But many of the people afterwards that I've talked to have said that they can see the new vision, they understand the clarity of it and what we're trying to do. It just sucks that we had to go through that pain to get there. And I agree with that. But as leaders, we have the, the obligation to look at what's best for the entire business and how do we position it so that people that want to have a career there, that want to be there for 10 years, can be there, that they can grow, that they can have families, that can do all of that kind of stuff, right? Yeah. And so... What we did during that time is now RPGs are going to a, to a new home. For the rest of, of Fantasy Flight games, what we've done is we've actually split it in two. Okay. This isn't something we've really talked about publicly yet. Um, we'll talk about it more as we go on and we we'll have more interesting information to reveal. But uh, um, just to, as you say, people are speculating a lot just so that they yeah. understand what's happening is they're, both, they're still both FFG. But we have FFG board and card game, and we have FFG miniatures, okay? And what that's going to allow us to do is for both of those teams to focus and specialize more. Yeah. Instead of being pulled in different directions in a lot of different ways, then they can really focus and specialize on what they do best, right? I mean, I'm really proud of the work that all of the studios I work with, it's a real privilege, you know, and, and people will say that, but it's not a platitude. It's ab absolutely true. We've known each other for a long time. I've talked to you a lot off camera yep. about how exciting it is to work with all of these women and men on a daily basis and see the work that they do. It's just amazing. Yeah. And now this is giving them a chance at FFG to really focus and specialize on stuff that they can do what I think some of the best stuff in the world in those areas and have the infrastructure and resources to do that properly. Do you think that's why, it, it sounds like across the board, even moving all the RPGs into a single studio, yeah. right? Uh, and the way the studios are working and, you know, when, I remember back when Asmodee and Fantasy Flight merged, mm -hmm. um, that the studios separated from like the business functions. Yep. And it was like the studios just get to make great games, which yes. is what they're good at. And mm -hmm. They don't have to worry about accounting and finance and yeah. reporting, all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. um, but it sounds like there's a, a massive strategic shift towards focus. You were even saying it makes sense. Mm -hmm. There's too many games coming out. Yeah. So we need to release less, better, more successful games. Mm -hmm. uh, that's how we're going to cut through the noise. Yeah. Focusing in on these. Well, these in marketing, we'll things. talk about that too, but go ahead. I was getting ready to say, um, do you think that's why, you know, over the past five or six years, particularly with Fantasy Flight games, we've seen a lot of games come and go, mm -hmm. right? I'm, I'm thinking about. Uh, some of my favorite games, right? Conquest is one uh, mm -hmm. that I, I just wish it could have lasted longer. Imperial Assault yeah. is another game. Mm -hmm. Even recently with Star Wars Destiny and mm -hmm. the Star Wars LCG. Do you think that that lack of focus and being maybe spread too thin uh, is a major contributor as to why those games didn't have the, the long tail success that uh, other games might see? Well, I would say yes and no in some degree because I would argue some of those games did have a long-term success. Uh, Imperial Assault, for example, still had an incredible year in 2019 without new releases. Isn't it's that still, amazing? It's still selling incredibly strong, like really, really strong. That's awesome. Um, and the tale of Imperial Assault is not done. <laughs> I'll oh really? You yeah. There's your first spoiler oh, for the day. All right. The, you can't. Um, so I, I'm gonna give you. I a, can. I can't say that. <laughs> I, I, can't, I can't. I know you can say that. <laughs> I, I don't know that you understand <laughs> the. Uh, it it feels like the. It reminds me in some ways of like. Um, I'm trying to think of a good analogy in like movies or TV where like, uh, it came out and it was like I want to say Firefly, but that's a very extreme example. And it's like, people are catching it now mm -hmm. that it's like, just out right. Yeah. And it's just there. Uh, that it feels like there is like this underground like energy for this game. Mm -hmm. And uh, anyways, no, well, like I said, it still sells incredibly well. That's really um, cool. And uh, we're not prepared to talk about that. That's a that's a long long way out. But there's still some more stuff to say about that. But I think also defining what some of these games mean. And Destiny's a different thing, and we'll talk about that separately. But Imperial Assault, there's actually years worth of content in there to, to enjoy. 
Like already out. That's in, already in out, yeah. right? And now I get that that some of the, especially the more rabid and dedicated fans have already burned through that content. But I'm not sure games of that style have to have new content all the time to still be out there and sell perennially year after year. Sure. I can tell you what, a Playmat or two came out for Imperial Assault last year, and it still had a very, very strong year. That's awesome. Like, I, I didn't even know you guys were still making it. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I thought it was like... No, uh, we're still reprinting we're it. It's still here. out there. It's still going. Really? Yes. That's fascinating. And people... And I can tell you for sure, new people are discovering it every day because we're making new core sets all the time. That's awesome. So so you said... I mean, obviously, it seems like there's shift towards focus. Yeah. And to kind of cut through the noise mm -hmm. of the industry. But you also said that, uh, you know, people that are still there, people that have maybe uh, left or had to leave uh, yeah. the, the organization... Um, are starting to get a clear understanding and appreciation for the vision. Yeah. Um, so what is the vision? So that the vision is to do less, make it count for more, right? And to really be focused and specialized. I think FFG's DNA, like on that card and board game side, is what's most people's first introduction to FFG over the past couple decades has been these big, immersive, expansive board games. Now, they have some stuff on the schedule that's going to blow people's minds, right? Like, literally. And they're going to have the infrastructure and the resources and the ability to focus on it because they're not trying to do too many things, Sure. right? So now, part of that, that division is now there is a dedicated OP team for those card games. So that means Keyforge, Legend of the Five Rings... In all the other card games are going to be... Once you start naming names, we've got a problem here. You're going to yeah. leave a game off, people are going to be like... Yeah, so I'm just going to stop OP right there. That doesn't mean that, that, that anything's happening to yeah, it, all yeah, right? Totally. Um, one, I'm jet lagged. Two, yeah. it's an exhaustive list, right? Um, <laughs> but there's a team that's just dedicated just to that. Sure. They're not going to get pulled off to work on X-Wing. They're not going to get pulled off to work on something else. They're going to be working on that. And then on, for the miniatures team, the, the inverse is true, right? They have three games. They have Legion... They have X-Wing and they have Armada. That's right. They have Armada. Armada is alive and well. Okay. He, that's a game that, like, again, it's it's this pocket where it's like, yeah. there's not that it's many incredible. releases coming out. I love like, that fan moving. base, how dedicated they are. They are in. So here's your second spoiler for the day. All right. Uh, Clone Wars Armada, Wave 1 is Q4 of this year. All right. People are going to be amped about yeah. that. Uh, wave two, cool ships in there. Wave 2 is uh, Q1 of next year. So you guys are going to be moving. Oh yeah, yeah. There's 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 cool stuff for that. All right, very yeah. cool. Yeah, I can say for uh, for those three lines, uh, we just had our line plan approved by uh, Lucasfilm through 2023, and they said it was the strongest line plan they'd ever seen for those games. That's awesome. So so there's a lot to be excited about. There's a lot to be excited about. Now that. where you you mentioned X-wing, Armada, and Legion. Yeah. Um, where would you even classify something like Imperial Assault? That's over in the boarding card. On the other half of it? Yep. All right, cool. Yep. Um, so more focus mm -hmm. uh, to cut through the noise and support yep. these games. And that's not just with FFG, for example. Z-Man games, um, a lot of their portfolio is going away as they're focusing on different things. They have new stuff coming, but some of the other stuff that they used to do has gone away to make room for what they're doing. Okay. Right? Yeah. And then we have Atomic Mass out on the West Coast that's doing Crisis Protocol. That's what they're doing. That's, we, that's we have talked thing. about game number two. That will probably be 2022. Okay. Right? But it's very, very focused. Very, sure. very focused. I mean, I think starting a new studio, they have the backing of, of Asmo Day, but it's difficult to establish a game. Yeah, it's a been a lot of work. Those guys have done an incredible job. Yeah, the models look great. They do. They're a lot of fun. <laughs> I spent way more time painting than I have playing. Yeah. Uh, so that's, uh, I mean, in, in this context, right, uh, you have all these games coming out. You have Asmodee across all their studios mm -hmm. shifting to a much more focused approach. Um, so we're here at Gamma, and obviously uh, there's a ton of retailers here. Mm -hmm. I think that uh, that's a, something we've been talking about a lot is local retail. So how does Asmodee see uh, basically retail fitting into this puzzle moving forward? Well, it's still vitally important, right? That's where new gamers are made every day. So, um, which you know that, you, you do that all the time, right? <laughs> yep. But uh, I think not only are they a hub for people to play and communities to grow, but they're teaching people how to play. They're doing demos all the time. They're answering questions all the time. Uh, 
I personally love, as you know, I had a hobby game store in another lifetime ago, right? Yeah. So I have special feelings for that. But beyond the, beyond my own personal feelings, uh, Asmodee sees it, it's a very, very vital channel for us and a channel that we think is going to continue to grow because I think it's that, that personal face-to-face -face connection, right? Um, as much as the world has digitized, and we've talked about this a lot, you know, I'm of the bad habit. The first thing I look at in the morning is my cell phone, and it's the last <laughs> thing I look at at night. And, you aren't uh, alone. And uh, I feel uncomfortable if I leave it in the other room. Um, it says something unhealthy about me, but it's true, right? <laughs> uh, and I think the more that we're involved in that, the more we want to have face-to-face -face interactions. And tabletop games do that better than anything else I know. So I think tabletop games in general are going to continue to thrive as we go forward. Uh, the industry has to figure out I think it's release cadence a little bit more because what's happening isn't sustainable. And I think that hobby retail is always going to be a very important part of that. So what do you think, you know, you're saying they create new players and it's uh -huh. face to face experience. Yeah. Um, you know, if there are retailers watching or listening to this at some point, what is it that retailers can do uh, to add value that Asmodee particularly uh, would, you know, is it extensive focus on creating new players? Is it hosting communities? Is it uh, you know, curating games better. What 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 could well, make I think them super the, valuable? Yes, yes, and yes. <laughs> All the above. All of the above. Yeah, I think that's true. I think it's. I don't think retailers should even try to carry everything that's coming out anymore. Like you can't. Yeah. You can't keep up with that. At one point you could though, right? Oh, one point you could. When I was doing it, you could. At one point you almost had to. Yeah, but now that's that's not the case, and I don't think that's even what uh, in customers, the in fans and, and players are even looking for. They know the types of, you know, so I think stores stores probably have to specialize some too, right? And, and not try to carry everything. Sure. But where can they be the experts that, that their customers can rely on? And that can be a bit of a broader range, right? But it can't be everything. It just can't. There's just, it's just too much. It's crazy. Way too much. It's, yes. So it's kind of interesting. I, I don't exactly necessarily have a question for it, but Thinking about the games you were mentioning earlier in Pill Assault, mm -hmm. having these longer legs, uh, Armada yeah. having these longer mm -hmm. legs, where there's not a lot coming out, but it still seems to keep moving. Um, and so, you know, what's also interesting about this is you're saying three or 4,000 games are coming out a year. Yeah. But it also seems that of all of the tens of thousands of games that have come out, mm -hmm. uh, there is a continual interest in the past. So how does that, you know, I feel like you know, you're talking about focus and the mm -hmm. new games that are coming out and supporting the lines that are out. Um, but how how do... Uh, there's these like this history, this backlog of mm -hmm. games, right? Uh, is there anything in the industry that you think accounts for that, or should account for that? Well, I think some of the things that you talked about, why are they still popular with all these other games coming out, is because they really resonated with a strong fan base, and those people are still recommending it to their friends, right? One of the things that we focus on, on like I know on the sales and distribution side, Andre talks a lot about his bestsellers program. And what we're seeing with that is uh, looking at him, talking to him and his team about that and, and talking to a lot of retailers myself is finding games that they know is going to sell month after month, year after year. Sure. And it's finding that, right? And it's not going to be all of those tens of thousands of games that have come out. That's going to be a smaller number. Very few of them. What, whatever that number is. And so what we're trying to do is help them curate that and what I've challenged the studios to do is to work more towards aiming for games that you know, retail can count on for being there this year, next year, five years from now. Like have very long life cycles that can capture a, a big audience. That doesn't mean they have to be huge games. Some of them are gonna be very small games, but really resonate with people for a long time. So I know Fantasy Flight particularly, you said a lot of people interact with them for the first time with these expansive immersive mm -hmm. board games, right? Yeah. Um, for us, my first interaction with Fantasy Flight was actually the Game of Thrones and Lord of the Rings living card games. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm most familiar with Fantasy Flight as uh, you know the purveyor of these community-driven, mm -hmm. expandable yeah. type games. Um, but it almost seems like uh, you know. I, I guess my next question is, uh, you know, is this uh, the amount of product coming out making games like that even more of a challenge to find a foothold and be successful because uh, you know, you have games like Imperial Assault that you stop releasing stuff mm -hmm. for, but it just keeps moving. Yeah. Right. So if you create these kind of evergreen titles, mm -hmm. 
Um, and is there any is there any friction there in terms of just the strategy of, of products to release? I don't know about friction, but it's trying to find the sweet spot, right? Um, everything that everything that we publish has a special place in our heart. That's the reason that we're publishing it, right? Sure. And so, just deciding on a on a game's life cycle is is very tough. It's very stressful, right? And because that's like when people ask me what's my favorite game, you're trying to ask me what my favorite kid is, right? Like that's <laughs> that's terrible. I don't want to answer that question. Sometimes I don't know how to answer that question. Sure. It's what did I play this weekend? That's probably my favorite game right now, and it'll be different next weekend. I don't know, but um, one thing that's amazing to me is is how much of kind of the heart and soul the people that work on these games put into them, right? It's amazing. You can really see it, and it's really, really important to them. And I think that's why so many of these games across our studios resonate with so many people. It's because of the passion that goes into them, right? It's not slapping a label on something and, and kicking it out the door. It's yeah. how is this going to be an incredible experience? How is this going to be maybe a new take on something or something completely unique like Keyforge was, right? Sure. So... Um, I don't know if that really answers the question, but uh, I'll say yes. It's always it, it's always a challenge, I think, figuring that out. How many of those games are the right amount of games to have? Uh, we're having a lot of success with the cooperative LCGs right now, but even then, we challenge ourselves: like, is this the best release model for them? Is there some way that we can improve upon that? Sure. What's the best way to uh, to make these games enjoyable for the most amount of people for the longest amount of time? Yeah, and you know the cooperative LCG is competitive. You know, Destiny, yeah. etc. Um, I do think those have different cadences and life cycles. Sure, and I think obviously there's with a cooperative LCG you can have your one or even solo uh, mm -hmm. play these games. Uh, that at any point, even now, I think about a game like Lord of the Rings, yeah, which is still around, still being mm -hmm. made. It's a long-standing yeah. living card game, um, but you can kind of approach that and dive into that story at any point mm -hmm. and step by step. Yeah. And obviously the kind of continually evolving community-driven games. But then the dynamic of competitive games is much different. Significantly right? different. You have to be on top of where the meta is, make sure that you're buying the cards on the cadence that lets you keep pace with the meta. Yeah. And as important, you need other people to be doing that. Yes, yes you do. Or it all falls apart. It all Whereas, falls apart, yes. You know, we're about to start uh, on, on stream, actually, Stephen and I playing through Arkham, which I have... Uh, criminally underplayed. Okay. Uh, I, I played it, and I recognize this as an objectively great game, and I just yep. have criminally underplayed it. But, um, you know, with Arkham, it's like, I don't feel too far behind. And well, I'm because you're it's, not. It's three or four years in. It doesn't matter. And it doesn't matter. Not yep. at all. So Because we're going to start, and here's where we're going to start, and here's how yep. we're going to do it. Um, so, uh, to kind of talk about uh, one of those games, Champions, obviously, came mm -hmm. out last year. Yeah. Huge success. Marvel, living card game, cooperative. Oh, yeah. I mean, you can't ask for better. Yeah. I love that game. We play it all the time. Um, and... You know, yeah, it's fun, huh? It is. It is. It is very fun. I'm they having did, a really good They did good time. a great job. Yeah, I, uh, they certainly did. I'm very excited about Hulk, I, and mm -hmm. I don't know why. I've never been. A, I mean, Hulk's always. I've always been a fan of Hulk, but that's neither here nor there. What I want to ask about though is obviously that game. We're has about been, to geek out. Yeah, <laughs> just about to, uh, a couple yeah, times we've yeah. almost fallen in. Yeah. Uh, but w obviously that game is very successful. Oh yeah. Uh, so successful uh, that we've seen something we've seen with a lot of Fantasy Flight games, which mm -hmm. is. That first three to six to nine months, it is impossible to find sometimes. It's hard <coughs> to get. Uh, we talk about allocation all the time yep. on the podcast. I mean, last year we talked to, to death, I think. Uh, but I'm curious to get your take on, uh, it seems like a recurring problem that just keeps happening. Um, so do you have any, any thoughts on why that happens? We'll start there, and then we'll maybe talk about how it could maybe not happen in the future. Sure, because it's tough on the... On the way the whole solicitation process works, it makes it very, very hard to get that right. In fact, it's almost set up to not work <laughs> the way it is. What right? do you mean by that? Well, because I think I know what you mean, but I want well, to. Well, because I think that for most of those games where you're having those issues, they have to go to print before final numbers are coming in. And it's easy to say in hindsight, oh, well, you should you should have known, right? But there's been times where printed way too much and it's sitting in the warehouse. That starves resources, right? That hurts on a yeah. lot of different levels. That's like huge, right? right? Like yeah. That's a big problem. Right? And so you can't do that very often. And so if it's a little bit conservative up front and we're chasing, that's a problem, but it's a better problem to have than, oh, 
they only ordered this much and we have this much in the warehouse. Uh-oh, yeah. that's a problem. Beyond being a problem for you, there's market conditions there too, yeah. right? Oversupply means yeah. that it gets discounted, mm -hmm. it gets devalued. Yeah. Retailers don't want to carry it or support it because it's mm -hmm. being sold cheaply, et cetera. Sure, and then it makes it harder to introduce new games because then people are like, oh, that last one didn't do very well sure. and discounted it out. Maybe like So it causes a lot of problems. Do you think, and this is a big question that could have a lot of answers. Okay. So I understand if we don't if we, if we can't solve this in our one conversation here, a problem that seems to be an issue across the industry, because you know, you're saying I mean, the reality check here is overprinting is horrible for publishers. Like I think it's, it's horrible for it's, everybody. Sure, it's yeah. horrible for, but it's particularly yeah. risky and horrible for a publisher. Yeah. Um, and then you have three or four thousand games coming out a year. Mm -hmm. um, so like you might make you know, it. It's easy when you see a game like Champions that hits. It's hard to find, and it's like, oh, why didn't they just make more? Mm -hmm. Like yeah, well, but the truth is, there's a lot of games that get printed that don't move at all. Yeah. Or that bear, you know move mm -hmm. very small percentage of the thing. Yeah. Um, but you mentioned the solicitation process, and I, one thing we always talk about and wonder is like. Well, the solicitation process is set up to fail. Um, is it not possible to consider changing that process? And well, if so, how could that be? We've talked addressed? about it a lot, but uh, then you're asking people to take risk on something that they don't know anything about way in advance. Way in advance. That's a very hard question, right? Do you want to commit to how much of this game do you want to commit to that's coming out nine months from now? that I can only tell you a little bit about. Uh, probably not that big, <laughs> not that big sure. a commitment, right? Yeah, but you know, I, I think about like, uh, the analogy we used was like movies coming out, mm -hmm. where it's like, you know, we've known Black Widow movies coming out yep. forever uh, and a day. And they do marketing and they're announcing about it. So I mean, is there a concern if you extend that period too far where there's actual information out about a game that what is the concern there? What, why, why couldn't you tell me about Champions nine months before so it comes out? So part of that is, and we've talked about that a lot, and we're going to take a few chances. We're going to try to do some stuff different on some key projects for 21 and see how they work. Okay. And so maybe that'll be a much different discussion the next time we talk. Okay, but that's um, something you're looking at. So we are, we are looking at, absolutely. Part of it, though, is because there's three to 4,000 games coming out a year, it's hard to hold anybody's attention for more than five minutes. Sure. Let alone nine months. Yeah, let alone nine months. And there's times in the past where we've talked about a game nine months out, and then the reaction gets to be halfway through that. Don't tell me any more about this game until it's on until you're saying it's on sale now. Right? And so you gotta balance that out. I've I've literally read those remarks. Yeah. Like I'm not making that up. I literally have read those remarks. I don't want to hear anything more about this game until you say it's on sale now. Tells it able to be. In and it's still four months out. Oh, okay, that's that's a problem. Yeah. So um, it's I'd like to say it's just an easy formula to work out and figure out, but it's not. Obviously, so it's not. We're going to try solved. we're going to try some different things for next year though, and see what happens with it. Well, I'm excited uh, to see that. Something else that we're doing differently in this new mindset with the studios is more prolonged marketing campaigns. Okay. So I use FFG for an example. The legacy of that is a big hype for a game until it launches, then don't talk about it until an expansion comes out, because we're talking about the next big thing that's coming, and the next, yeah. and the so next. So, as an example, you might announce a new game at Gen Con, yeah. like a Destiny. Mm -hmm. uh, you talk a lot about it between then and when it comes out, Yeah, and then it, that was a whole unique scenario. But that it comes a, out, yeah. it's crazy, uh, even with Champions, right, it goes mm -hmm. crazy. And so you're saying extending the period after that point, yes. where you're supporting and marketing this yes. game. And planning for that, and I assume planning from that from the beginning. If you're going to plan on marketing, you would also be willing to plan on having more inventory around mm -hmm. because you know you're going to be having a chance yep. to, to to move this kind yeah. of thing. So we're going to try different things. We're recruiting on the marketing side for both the boarding card and the miniature studio. Yeah. Right. So again, a, a strategic mind shift and making sure that we have the right infrastructure and the right resources. Right. So we're bringing in some very talented marketers to work, you know, and, and bolstering those teams up and. In the same thing, you know, to to pick the key titles that that we're going to market for over a much longer period of time. Nice. Yeah. So uh, obviously, I, I mentioned Destiny earlier. We yeah. we just got out of the uh, ICV two panel. They were talking about a handful of stats and whatnot. Um, and as a, a fan of Star Wars, and obviously mm -hmm. Asmodee having a Star Wars license, yeah. one of the things that they were saying is basically uh, that they believe the Star Wars IP is weakening, uh, particularly in the tabletop market. So. 
Um, you mentioned, you know, you're... <laughs> okay. <laughs> the, uh, uh, any any uh, thoughts on that, right? I mean, sure. not necessarily like what's your take on Star Wars, but uh, just the future of Star Wars in tabletop, I guess. Okay. Well, let's start with Destiny, and then I'll get into the future yeah, of Star okay. Wars tabletop, I, right? Because I know you've been you've been asking all around it. You want to talk about it. I get it, right? Like, So that was a, a game that we had a lot of conversations with, some of them even on camera, I think, in a game that we're really hyped about. One of the biggest launches in the company's history. Sure. It was it, crazy. It was eclipsed by, by uh, Keyforge, but up till then, I think it was the biggest launch in FFG's history, right? Um, and did very, very well for a long time. The... The cold reality of it, though, is the the unique unique nature of it in the dice put a burden on that game that it just couldn't sustain anymore. So the right. cost of production, the size, the time, yeah, the, the shipping, yeah, especially the dice with the plastic and all of that, just yeah. added a burden to it. Time to manufacture, what that cost, a million factors that I'm not going to get into today. Yeah. But like, well, even, even just very simply, yeah. it's something I didn't really appreciate. Over the past couple of years, we've kind of been going back and revisiting games from our childhood, right? Yeah. I, I have, I'm on like an old games kick. Yeah, I, I saw that. Yeah. Uh, but beyond that, one of those games was Pokemon, which mm -hmm. is a game that really got me into mm -hmm. card games uh, yeah. proper, right? And so we started supporting it locally and online and whatnot. And uh, the thing that blew me away, because we, we kind of just avoided collectible games for a long time. Yeah. Destiny was actually our first step back in after yep. a seven, eight year mm -hmm. hiatus. And one of the just simple factors <coughs> that I, I don't think a lot of people think about is uh, we got the booster boxes in. Yeah. And it's like, this thing is tiny. Mm -hmm. And so there's just even practical implications of a game like Destiny with the dice and the way the boxes are big. Yeah. And shipping and cases and distribution there's and warehousing. A, there's and, a lot, yes. Th so that's just one mm -hmm. very basic example. But yeah. anyways, continue, sorry. So um, it's unfortunate, but it's always sad and painful when a game runs its course. Yeah. But it had a great life. It had a really great life. A lot of fun was had with that game. A lot of memories. Um, I still remember that misplay at the end of our game at Celebration. It still, <laughs> still haunts me sometimes. Yeah. But uh, um, that's the beauty of those games, right? Yeah. And there's no reason why people can't keep enjoying that game, even right. though we don't make new content for it. I have every intent to do so. Yeah. And, and I think a lot of people will. We've heard about that. And just like you're revisiting some some of those games you're revisiting, there's been people that never stopped playing those games. That's that's kind of what's interesting about these older games, though. Right? And there, and there's nothing to there's nothing to keep people from doing that. I think that there's been this kind of illusion or misperception built up that when the new content stops, well, I can't play that anymore. Well, why? Why why can't you? Right, so obviously the challenge is that when there is new product coming out, there's there's other people to play against. Yeah, and th these games inherently are. At but that best. community wasn't the size isn't the size it is now that it was before either. Right. Yeah. So, um, yeah. So, what you would say though, it sounds like what you're saying is that uh, the future of Star Wars and tabletop uh, could well be very bright. Oh, I can talk about that for a while if you all right, want. Yeah, yeah, I would love to talk about yeah, it. There's, like I said, I don't want to pin you into it, but uh, <laughs> no, let's do it. Right. Yeah, it's Star right. Wars. So um, it's just us, right? Uh huh. Yeah, this so, is not being filmed or posted yeah. anywhere. Um, like I said, we turned in about a month ago. I want to say you said through 2023. Through 2023, product plan for uh, Legion X-wing Armada. And they came back definitively saying, this is the best product plan we've seen out of FFG ever, right? Um, there's also big plans on the board, board and card game side. Not going to talk about those too much today. But um, there are plans. But there are plans, yep. That's uh, enough. We can, we can survive the desert on that one. Uh, I will tell you, because this is something that you and I have talked about, a game that we both love, there is definitely more Outer Rim in the future. Great. That's an awesome board game. It is an awesome board game. And there is more of that coming. All right? All right. Um, and there are more board games coming. That's exciting. So I will tell you more that. More board games? Yes, there are. Ah, oh, um, really? Yes, yeah. That's awesome. I, I, yeah. It definitely feels, obviously, Fantasy Flight has been doing a lot of card games, miniature mm -hmm. games. Um, and they've done Outer Rim, and then they did Rebellion. Yeah. Right, as two uh, board game products. Mm -hmm. But it felt like forever there's been kind of an under, underserving of Specifically, Star Wars yeah, board games. Yeah, and I'm not going to get into all the details of that, but uh, we're well aware of that. You're going to see some new stuff next year, and in 2022, and in 2023. Excellent. On that side, 
And then on this side with the miniatures games, it's crazy good. It's, um, Legion has really started to find its footing. And I think a lot of that has to do with stuff that we had in place for a long time that we just knew would take. Because one of the complaints that we've heard from people is, oh, there's not enough variety. There's not enough factions. Now adding the Clone Wars into that has doubled the factions. There's going to be more variety coming. I'm not going to get into super details on that. Um, a lot of teases going on. A here. lot of teases. You will see, well, here's something a little more concrete. You will see stuff from The Mandalorian in Legion in X-Wing next year. Okay, so 2021. Yes. Uh, and that's a great show. It is a great show. Two thumbs up on that one. Yes, yeah. Um, so you will see content across multiple games that's built on Mandalorian Season 1 and Season 2. All right, so you're telling so. me you've seen things from Season 2. This is a whole separate line of questions now. I'm just kidding. Uh, I'm not going to talk about <laughs> I'm that. I'm not going to ask all. you about yeah. that. Yeah. Um, so, all that said, uh, I, I, is there anything else that uh, people watching? I know there's a lot of speculation in general um, about everything at Asmodee, everything going on yeah. with Star Wars games mm -hmm. and IPs and losing the yep. license and getting prepared for being bought. I mean, I've seen every theory possible. Okay. Um, but to all the people speculating, uh, what would you say in regards to, just to kind of close it out here? Uh, the future of uh, Asmo Day um, and, and how it looks and how it might affect them as players slash retailers slash okay. distributors. So probably the for people that know me, this will resonate more, but hopefully it comes across. I love what I do. I feel like I'm blessed to have this opportunity. I'm very, very grateful uh, for the role that I play and especially for the people I get to work with. As much as I love my job and I love this industry, I love my family more. If, uh, if I didn't think this is the place to be, that we weren't building and growing and doing exciting things, I wouldn't be here. I'd go do something else. Sure. So you're saying you the future is bright and exciting. Yeah, I mean, that here. sounds very cl cliche, right? But what I'm saying is I am incredibly excited about what we're doing. I agree with Lucasfilm. It is the strongest product plan that I've seen for those Star Wars games, period, the end. And you and I have played X-Wing together, and you know how much X-Wing I've played over the years. Yeah. Uh, you've seen some of my Legion stuff that I've been painting. All the time. Uh, um, so, yeah, that's it's super, super strong. Cool. Super. I would love to share more about it today, but I just can't. Well, I really appreciate you taking the time here again. I know yep. you have a full schedule to sit down with us and talk about what's going on at Asmo Day. We'll have to catch up with you either at Gen Con or at Gamma next year. Sure, and, we shouldn't wait four uh, years next time. Yeah, I, I have a feeling it won't be four <laughs> okay. years this time. So yeah. thank you so much. All I right. appreciate it. Thank, thank you. you all so much for watching and or listening. We have plenty more coming from Gamma Expo 2020. Stay tuned and until then, keep going.